Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Financial Literacy with TC. I am your host, TC. As always, I want to thank you for joining me. You could have chosen any podcast in the world to listen to, but you chose to listen to mine, and I'm always appreciative of that. So today I have one of my good friends, Starshima Duncan, and she is a mental health therapist. She currently has her own business or her own counseling service called For My Good Counseling Services. She also is the founder of a nonprofit called We Are Beautiful, and she also hails from a grad as a graduate of Carlo University. Um, I'm so thankful for her to be able to join me today because we're going to talk about financial uh, wellness and financial stress and just the mental health aspect of dealing with uh, finances. So I want to give a warm welcome and a huge thank you to Starshima Duncan. Starshima, if you want to say hello to our audience. Hello, everybody. <laughs> How are you? Um, so let's dive right into it. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time out to join me. Um, you are someone who, in the Pittsburgh area, I've been following a lot because you do a lot of great things in the community. And I just thought it would be perfect to have you join me because as a mental health therapist, um, you can speak to some of the things that I witness and see in our black in our communities, um, predominantly in the black community, where individuals struggle with um, taking care of their finances or what they need to do, and it creates a lot of different stress. Um, obviously, I'm not qualified <laughs> to speak about mental health, um, so I wanted to. I was excited to have you come on because I know that's an area for you, and just based on your level of expertise and the amount of people you deal with and who you see. Um, I knew you would be able to bring some valuable information um, to this topic, and uh, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to, one, introduce yourself, and if, because I know I read your bio, but I may have skipped a step or I might have missed something, so you can correct me if I did. <laughs> no, that's correct. Um, for my good counseling service, um, I've been around since 2018, um, and we are actually expanding now so we'll be bringing on two new therapists awesome so it went from being a solo practice to now it's a group practice awesome so let's get right into it uh what inspired you or what um, made you get into you know being a mental health therapist um if you want to go back from if you want to go all the way back to your youth or if you want to just go to college or you know high school when you were picking the college you wanted to go to um whatever triggered oh i'm gonna be a mental health therapist <laughs> <laughs> um, I always started when the job chose me. I didn't choose the job. Okay. Um, my mom would always say, "You people, you listen to people and people talk." Yeah. And I, I didn't really think anything of it. I just like people are talking. I'm just listening. <laughs> um, and what really got me into it was my uncle. After my grandma had passed away, he had got diagnosed with schizophrenia, mm. and um, I never understood the diagnosis. Um, like I never, I watched, we watched them progressively get worse, but I never understood it. And so I remember when I went to college, I kept saying, I want to help people. Right. So everything we always think of is if we go back to, I'm an eighties baby, 80s, nineties. Well, I was born in the late seventies, but eighties I'm baby. And we think about the Huxtables and we always thought about the two main jobs that, you know, um, the Cosby show had was Cliff was a doctor right. and Claire was a lawyer and right. they made money and they were quote unquote rich. And so I was like, I'm going to be a doctor. <laughs> and I went to school and I suck at math and I mm. suck at science. And those are the two main things you need to be a doctor. And right. so I took my first psychology class and it just opened my eyes. And so I remember back to the time with my uncle and I kept saying, I really want to understand why people do what they do and get a better understanding and to be able to create that space for them to talk. And so that's what made me go into the field um, awesome. was because of those things. So. Oh, yeah. And honestly, that speaks volumes because, um, you know, obviously for those who are new to my audience, um, you know, I've been I'm in the I work for the financial institutions and I typically just got into that space because I didn't come from a background of money. Um, you know, my parents didn't have a amount of wealth that yeah. to leave to me or teach me about money. Um, so when I got into the space of working for a financial institution, it really hit home that, oh, this is something that I can use to help others understand better ways to manage their money. 
Um, so basically how you fell into, you know, your passion, I kind of fell into mine and didn't know it was a passion until <laughs> I was like, oh, I have a great understanding of what's going on and why things are. And uh, so I, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, what led you to uh, start your own practice? Is that the appropriate way to say it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, the one big thing is I've worked for many agencies and you are like box. So you only can do so much because you have to meet your quota. Right. You have to do certain things. And I remember many a time sitting across from a client and wanting to do more, but couldn't because that's not my role. Right. And so, and especially in our community, it was a lot harder to get us to see, for me to see us. Right. So it was like when you came in, like you were under there's several therapists and whoever needed this client you took, whether, you know, if you wanted a white one or a black one, it didn't make a difference. Right. And when I did get a chance to work with our community, you know, just to be able to create that space, I wanted to do more of it. And so my thing was to be able to do it in my way and to be able to be able to say, okay, let's talk this way. And so that's what made me branch out to start my own practice. And I love that because I can relate to that from the standpoint when we talk about financial literacy, which we're going to dive into financial literacy as it pertains to mental uh, mental health. Mm -hmm. um, when I looked up financial literacy, I saw a lot of individuals who didn't look like me telling people in our communities or just black people in general, oh, do this with your money, do this with your money. Meanwhile, a lot of them didn't come from the circumstances that most African Americans come from, mm -hmm. which is a lot, you know, most African Americans aren't coming from well, two home parent mm -hmm. households, um, coming from a ton of money, you know, they don't get a lot of those um, trials and tribulations that, you know, the individual you'll find on social media or Google or, you know, some of these uh, gurus are telling you do this with your money, do that with your money, and they're trying to educate us, but they don't have our background. They might have, you know, a trust fund or $2 million just sitting there waiting for them, you know, whatever the circumstances. So uh, for me to create this podcast, it was really just to have representation in the space that I knew, you know, I come from the inner city. I come from a family where we didn't have a ton of money to even learn about, you know, budgeting, um, how to write a check. You know, simple things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I wanted to create this platform to make sure that I can have conversations and be that representation that I don't see on the internet. When I Google financial literacy, I don't see a ton of um, black yeah. successful, you know, there's black people with money, obviously, but I don't see them writing books or talking to our people about how they have accumulated their wealth. They might do it on other platforms, but you really got to search and dig yeah. and read books and, you know, it's just not an even plant field. So. It's a needle in a haystack. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Whatever field you go to, we're a needle in a haystack. Gotcha. So let's get right into um, just what, if any, have you experienced? Um, you know, obviously, you know, you don't have to divulge anything that isn't, you know, uh, relevant to the topic. But what have you come across in your career um, or is your time as a mental health therapist where individuals may or may not have dealt with things that related to their finances that you know probably hindered them from you know moving forward with uh some struggles that they may or may not had um specifically when it comes to finances like is that a topic of conversation when you're meeting with people is that something you run across um a lot so when the mental mental health field you have the insurance that covers and some people's insurance does not cover the whole thing gotcha. so they have a copay and a lot of times if they can't afford the copay that keeps them from wanting to get services so you'll see that a lot of times um, if a therapist that they prefer doesn't accept their insurance and they have to pay out of pocket um, you'll see especially in our community is choosing between what I, you know, bills and stuff at home <clears throat> compared to right. paying for my mental health. And so that's one of the, one of the other reasons why I really did step out is because we would turn away people because they couldn't afford services. And so that is a big struggle in our community is because if my insurance doesn't cover or my insurance doesn't 
you don't accept it, then where do I go? But right. I really want to work with you. Um, and so a lot of times you do see that. And then they'll start working with you and they hit a financial bump. And what's the first thing that it goes into my mental health. You know? Right. Because um, so, not to cut you off, but most people see it as a luxury yeah. when it's really a necessity. Yeah. Um, because your mental health is everything. If yeah. you aren't in a good mental space, who knows what can happen. And it can impact a lot of different things. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm sorry. But no, that, that plays a big role. Because yeah. if you think about it, when you look at your budget, um, where does it go in? If you're budgeting at yeah, all. Yeah, if, if, you're right, if you're budgeting at all. But that does play, definitely play a role. So a lot of times to have that difficult conversation with clients um, and for me personally, when I first started out, I did provide a lot of um, free services just because I wanted to be able to provide <clears throat> services to clients. But then after a while, I was like, okay, you know, you have to pay something because <laughs> I got to pay something. Right. And that exactly. becomes a struggle. But it's just picking between what's more important when I get paid. Right. Um, if I only have $20 left and my co-pay is $20. I'm not going to pay my copay. I'd rather keep the twenty dollars. Gotcha. And honestly, um, when I think about that, it's kind of the biggest thing that I've always thought was a problem in our community. Um, not just mental health, but health in general. Um, we don't see it as something that is a necessity. So therefore, you know, if it if it doesn't fit within what we need immediately, we'll cut it out. Mm -hmm. And um, just because I wanted to make sure we're giving some valuable information, um, I did a little research on my own just to, you know, be able to add <laughs> to this conversation. Um, so I'm going to cite the source, which was Securian Financial. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, they did a study, um, I think as recent as 2023, I pulled this from, and it was 42% say that money of Americans... 42% uh, of Americans say that money is what negative, negatively affected, affects their mental health. And I just think that's crazy because it doesn't even really get into African Americans. So if that's 42 of Americans um, as a whole, um, I would probably have to do some research to see how much of that is this African American. So um, that was just an astonishing stat to me. Um, and I'm just curious, when you're doing sessions with people, is that like a number one topic or is that, where does that typically fall in some of the issues that people divulge to you? So you think, and just give you a quick mental health lesson, it is called the Maslow hierarchy of needs. Okay. And our basic needs, if our basic needs are not met, which is like food, shelter, clothing, if that is not met, you can't go up the hierarchy. Gotcha. And so and a lot of times when you do meet with a client, and say they've hit a financial snag and their lights, they got a termination notice. That is their main focus. So sometimes they will even cancel sessions because mm. they're so focused on how can I keep you know, this necessity on um, or in session, you're processing that. So a lot of times financial stuff plays a big role because it causes a lot of anxiety um, right. for some people. Now, some people can sleep good at night and be like, I don't care, let's shut the lights off, the gas, it is what it right. is. But um, some people, you will see a lot of, you know, a lot of that being caused because they're far, they're, you know, how am I going to catch up? This is, you know, just this amount is just too much. And right. how did I get here? And so when that need is not met, at that level, it's hard to even process anything else because I'm focusing on how to meet that need. Right. And so even when you said 42%, I would even argue to say it's even higher right. because a lot of things with you know inflation and everything going up, people yes. are constantly very anxious about every dollar being spent, you know, and even if you ask for something small as $20, they have to really think about how do I, what can I do here? Like, right. do I, can I afford the $20 or not? Right. Um, and sometimes even you put in perspective of like, if you didn't go to McDonald's for a week, that equals the $20. But to them, that that doesn't make sense. Even though I might have swiped a card at McDonald's, it still doesn't make sense that I didn't go to McDonald's for 20 weeks to 20 for a week to give you that $20. Right, exactly. <laughs> and honestly, um, 
<clears throat> you know, the biggest thing is, and you'll probably know more about this than I will, um, what, anytime I hear situations like you just described, to me, I just hear stress. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you are more qualified than I to, you know, quantify what stress, I mean, because stress for everybody looks different. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but I know for me, when I think about my financial situation, if I don't do, um, obviously I do a weekly budget, and then I do a monthly budget, and then I do a budget with me and my wife. And really these are habits we've incorporated, you know, we're two years married. Um, we've incorporated as we go on, mm -hmm. because if something didn't work that first month, we overspent, now we're adjusting and making you know changes so that way we can do better the following month. And I say all that to say, if we don't, now it's to the point, if we don't do that, the stress between, you know, oh, we need to, because <laughs> now we're not doing what we set out to do. Mm -hmm. And I know you can speak to, you know, what people deal with as far as different stress levels. You've seen things of that nature, um, but just your experience, how does stress um, factor into, you know, when you're dealing with people? So even when you just talked about your budget, it came to my mind. Like, can I set a budget if my pay does not equal what I earn? Right. So you think that's like even talking about a budget, and I can even go back to when I was struggling out of college, and I had yes. was um in my was in my um marriage, my um prior marriage, and just dealing with that and having a child and trying to manage household. And when I looked at my paycheck, and I paid everything, now I'm at zero. So where am I budgeting? You right. know what I'm saying? And so a lot of times the stress comes from even budgeting. Yes. You know, <laughs> like I'm just my my check just covered this. Right. That's it. And that's all it has. So you're telling me to budget this, you right. know? So it anxiety is straight high from that. Like right. just even talking about a budget. I think sometimes when you go in the community and say, let's budget, I you could just see us just go like, what do you mean a budget? Like, oh my goodness, what does that look like? Because we, if we don't, if you're, you bring home X amount of dollars and you add up everything and you pay everything in full, you done, exactly. <laughs> you're at zero. And now you gotta wait for two weeks exactly. like, to do it. So that's a stress in itself. So. And honestly, what I loved about that is, you know, that's just talking about um, full-fledged adults. So recently I've been on, uh, I'll say a tour to work with as many schools and nonprofits as I can to meet uh, our, you know, young adults, teenagers, however, however early I can get to them, because at that point in time, financial literacy is pivotal because, mm -hmm. like you said, um, if you're in a household where, you know, you're you're in school, so you don't have a ton of things to pay or bills to pay, hopefully, and you don't have a lot of debts. That's the best time for you to be learning how to budget, mm -hmm. do some of these best practices. So now when you go off to college, when you go off to, you become a full-fledged adult and you have a lot of these more responsibilities added on, you can now have a better understanding of what that's going to look like for you. So now these practices are already in place, mm -hmm. hopefully. Um, so knowing that, you know, that's a way we can rectify the issue you just described. Yeah. Um, if we get this education into our school systems a lot earlier, um, I just saw an article or a news article that uh, our state is going to look to Im implement uh, financial literacy in 2026. Mm -hmm. And not to get into politics stuff here, but why are we waiting? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, financial literacy out of schools has been something that's been for, you know, centuries, yeah. ages. Yeah. And, it, you know, I don't want to get into the reason why, but <laughs> it's imperative that they we start giving our youth these, this information as early as possible while they don't have those stressors in their life. Yeah. So then when they do, they're better equipped to handle it. Yeah. So that's kind of what, <laughs> that's kind of why I loved what you just said. Um, and then I do have a statistic here that I found. And again, um, I'm only going to say that this pertains to the most recent study, which was in 2023. And it says 62% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. And it has a chart here of a cycle that you basically kind of described. Um, but I just want to, and you might be more familiar with this than I am, um, but I'm just going to give a quick synopsis of what it looks like and then show it on the screen hopefully you can see my sheet 
<laughs> uh, so it's going to say mental health problems make it harder to earn and manage your money, spending, and asking for help. And then it has a circle where you go to financial difficulty. Then financial difficulty causes stress, anxiety, made worse by collections, activity, or going without essentials. And then once you have that issue, then you're at mental health problems. And that could be coupled with other issues you might be dealing with in your life. You know, mm -hmm. a loss of a loved one. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of other stressors that, Lots you know, money ain't the only stressor in life, yeah. as we all know. <laughs> and then it goes right back to what I just said. Mental health problems make it harder to earn, manage money, spending, and ask for help. So it's basically a cycle. And based on what we know, uh, what would you say would be the best way to break that cycle? Um, simply for me, I would say, man, a financial therapist. <laughs> Because, oh, man. Or, you know, just resources. resources. I think that's the biggest. And having this taboo conversation. Yes. Because a lot of times we don't talk about. Like I said, to talk about a budget. I, I think when I bought my home, I had to go to a financial class just to talk about keeping my house. Yes. Um, because that's the biggest thing. Like, if you buy the house, how are you going to keep it? Absolutely. And I remember sitting there, and I was one of those that lived paycheck to paycheck, and I had saved up money, and the lady's talking about a budget, and I'm looking, and I'm like, what? The, this is a lot. Yes. It, it's overwhelming because to live paycheck to paycheck, how do you get out of that? Because we robbed Peter to pay Paul. Paul. Yep. Um, and so the biggest thing is learning and quick thing we'll say is learn to live within your means. Right. And a lot of times people do live within their means, but things have the cost of things go up, but I didn't get a raise. Right. So um, I more of the thing is the more of having a conversation of it and talking more about it and even figuring out resources like different things I can use, you know. A lot of times we get embarrassed when we get those assistance from the government. But those things can get you from point A to point B to you're no longer living paycheck to paycheck and you're Absolutely. able to go to the next level. Um, but a lot of times we have pride. And so the biggest thing is being able to sit down, have the conversation yep. and figure out how to even create a budget when you're living paycheck to paycheck. And, and honestly, important. I love that because you bring credence to why I do everything I do. Um, one, you talked about you know, buying, your first, buying your home. Those, so we did uh, our previous episodes before this one was about home buying seminars. Mm -hmm. And they are so imperative because if you've never bought a home before, you don't know what all comes with it. You yeah. think, oh, I just get the money, get the house. Good. There's so much more that comes with it. And if you're not being able, if you're not able to structure your life correctly, if you're not able to understand how much goes into the maintenance of the house, property taxes going up. Um, understanding the insurance part of it, um, escrow, all that stuff, you are going to set yourself up for failure. Mm -hmm. So the goal for most institutions, um, they want to have you take that course so that way you know what to expect and you're better prepared. Because if, let's be honest, if, if they foreclose on your house, that is not a good thing. No. And they want their money back. <laughs> so that's why a lot of, they pour into these programs because they want to make sure you understand what you're dealing with and you'll be able to um, adapt and be able to be successful when you start the home buying process. So if you have not checked out the home buying process, uh, the three episodes prior to this one, um, phenomenal stuff about home buying process. So definitely check it out. So I had to plug that. No, <laughs> and uh, so, and then the next thing you said was when we're talking about budgeting, um, when I go into these schools or these nonprofits that I work with, that's where I start budgeting, mm -hmm. understanding need versus want. Because how can you break a cycle if you don't even know what the problem is or what the or that you have a problem? Yeah. And so you basically just gave credence to a lot of the things that I try to address. Hence why this podcast exists, financial literacy with TC, because this cycle scares me. Mm -hmm. Because I know so many people who I see day to day who are in this cycle, but mm -hmm. they don't even know. Yeah. And, you know, they're not going to ask for help or they're not going to divulge that they are, they have stress because their finances are right. Mm -hmm. And I can look at their situation and say, hey, I know you don't make enough to support everything that you have going on. Why not? Let's work on your professionalism. Let's work on your people skills. Let's work on your resume 
so that way you can get a, high, a better high paying job mm -hmm. so that way now you're not longer living paycheck to paycheck you've already implemented some good budgeting techniques so now you have a little money to put away you have some money to invest mm -hmm. and that's kind of where you know we can start breaking this cycle um but it's it's going to take a lot of work yeah, it is. <laughs> I know it I starts, said a lot, but and it starts with you. <laughs> yes, the biggest thing is admitting that you want to do the work. Absolutely. Um, so let's get back on track here, because um, that was phenomenal. Um, what are some of the things that you foresee um, your practice, um, you know, doing moving forward? Because um, what you said, twenty eighteen, twenty seventeen, twenty eighteen, twenty eighteen. Thank you. I was correct. Um, twenty eighteen. Your practice has been in existence, and now that you've um, gone to 2023, now we're in 2024, um, has there been things that you just said you're bringing on two new therapists? Um, is there anything beyond 2024 or even in 2024 that you focused on and wanted to get accomplished with your practice? Um, so the one thing is to bring more therapists on. Um, therapy is a trend, I guess now. <laughs> right. <laughs> and especially, I mean, mental health is. Yeah, it's a I trend. mean, I can't. Yeah. I can't watch anything and somebody say, "Oh, that's not that's mental health right there." And I know they don't give us no money. Right. They give us five dollars. Yeah, like, but that's trendy. all you hear about. No, we're we're yeah, trendy, but yeah. they don't give us nothing. Yeah, uh, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. But um, <laughs> my goal is within this next year is to like at least have four therapists. Mm -hmm. The one thing I've been hearing from a lot of the art the community is there's not a black not a, enough black therapists and so um my big for me personally is always to pay it forward right and so i remember when i first graduated and needed my hours and needed a space to be able to do that um, and have a mentor and um i'll never forget my mentor um i still see her to this day and i'm thankful for her but she I mean, feel free to name drop, you know, um, if, you, if, if you want to. If not, that's I don't know if she watches it or not, but um, her name is Darla Timbo. She, Shout out um, to Darla. She has her own practice, and actually, she has like a twenty-four song called Twenty-Four Carat Juice. Oh, nice. I just saw she had that too. But um, she had really poured into me, and so I had told her to pay her back um, for all she did to me. That I would definitely do the same thing and pay it forward. Absolutely. And so my my practice is where I want to be able to provide that space for master's level clinicians to come in, mm -hmm. to get their hours, to learn, and to provide quality work. Because a lot of times it's just that that hurdle that we have, just to complete our hours to get to become licensed. And But we're good therapists. Right. And there's a lot of quality of us out there to provide good work. And so that is my goal is to bring on couple more to get, you know, to be able to provide services. And so whoever needs services can come in and not have to be like, I've been calling 10,000 people and Absolutely. I can barely find one of you. So Absolutely. So on that note, um, we'll take the time now for you to share how people can get in contact with you and your practice because um, I know like me and me and my wife, we're very intentional about if we need something, a service, a product, we want to be black owned first mm -hmm. or you know so um you know i definitely want to make sure people have an opportunity to know how to find you um and be able to you know acquire your services so I definitely want to let them know so you can find us on psychology today under for my good counseling services um on social media platform is actually under me starshima duncan for instagram and starshima duncan for facebook um and then I'm also on LinkedIn as well. So those are the places that you can find, or you can email us. Um, it's a long email. Um, so <laughs> even if I say it, you may forget it. But the easiest, I would say the easiest thing to do, I always tell everyone go on psychology today, type in black therapist, and I should be in the list yeah. of it. Um, if not, look even under Christian black therapist and I should pop up. But just remember for my good counseling services and you can find, if you Google it, you can find me. So. And also, anyone who needs to reach out to me, um, you can drop in the comments, and you can reach out to me and all my platforms, um, and I'll get you connected with uh, Starshima and her or her counseling service. Because um, the goal is, we definitely want our people to have access to an amazing resource 
Um, but you have to take the first step by reaching out or making it known that you need um, the service. So um, thank you for sharing that. So before we get into your nonprofit work, we are beautiful. Um, I just want to leave a few um, informational tips that I looked up that can help people. Um, the first one is uh, seven ways to manage your financial stress during trying times. Um, so I'm basically going to read the list, and if you want to chime in, feel free to do so. Okay. Um, the first one is prioritize what you can control or discretionary spending, meaning your needs versus your wants. Um, second, find ways to earn more money. Assess how much you actually spend bill-wise, all your everything that has to get paid, the needs versus the wants. If that number is X and you make Y is right here and it's, you know, there's not a huge differential, that means we need to assess uh, the amount of money or start a side hustle. Um, shoot, social media is blowing up with people making all type of money. So, I mean, you really just have to be able to understand where you're at and what you need to do to overcome. And there's so many different things you can do. Um, so that's number two. Number three, pay essential bills. Light bill, gas bill, the mortgage, the rent. You know, those are things that you definitely need to take care of. So make sure you prioritize those things. Number four, save money during trying times. This one's a little, when I saw it, I was like, this is a little tricky. Yeah, Hold on, I'm already struggling and I got to. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would say even if it's a couple dollars into an account that you have set aside, that's why I always tell people I have multiple accounts at multiple financial institutions. I got accounts that I ain't touched in maybe, you know, six, seven months, but I'll, every time I go to check on that account, I'll throw two, three dollars. in there. So in my mind, while I don't necessarily agree with it, I can see, yeah. you know, you still want to be saving no matter what you're going through because, you know, it can work wonders uh, moving I forward. Some a little old lady told me, I think, when I was going through the home buying process, she had said, if you put like $5 aside, right. it will add up. And she's like, I know it sounds like it's a lot, especially if you only, like, if I have 25 I put $5 aside. But she was like, it just starts off small and it'll grow. So Absolutely. even though it's I'm not the best saver. I won't. I will admit to that. I'm learning, but five dollars can go a long way if you keep adding to it every time. Absolutely. Know? Hey, I, it don't matter what age you are. It's never too late to start changing your habits and start saving. So. Yes. <laughs> um, number five was track your money saving progress. So what I love about this one is all the technology in the world that we have at our disposal right now. Um, people with these expensive iPhones and Android, if you do not have some app that helps you with money saving progress, you're doing yourself a disservice. If all you do with your phone is text, social media, and call, and that's the bare minimum you do with your phone, and you don't have any of these uh, financial apps that help you, hell, even whoever you bank with or whoever's your credit union should be able to have a service that allows you to keep track of your yeah. spending habits. Mm -hmm. um, I can't tell you how many times I go into schools or nonprofit organizations and I'm talking to people and they barely, they, oh, I use pen and paper. That's cool if that works for you. But some of these people got the newest iPhone and newest and <laughs> couldn't tell me, <laughs> couldn't tell me anything about their spending habits. Yeah. Well, so they I'm spent like, it on the iPhone. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you definitely need to be having a way to track your progress and see how you're saving um, so pivotal. Um, talk to your lenders. Um, basically, if you do have loans or you have a mortgage or if you have um, somebody, you have any borrowing out there, if you aren't going to be able to make the payment, have a conversation because there's ways that they can help you. And I know firsthand because I'm in, I'm in this industry, it's when they're not hearing from you and you're just letting, a, you're just letting it be late. Yeah. That's when it's a real big issue. Most lenders, there's things that they can do to help you. But if they can't find you, you ain't reaching out, or you're just being late just to be late, that's when you run into a problem. Um, because at the end of the day, it doesn't help if they're not, you know, they want to get the money back. So mm -hmm. they'll work with you, but you have to be able to communicate and ask for help. 
And then lastly, consult with an expert financial advisor. So I always tell this to people, when you have any banking relationship, get more out of that relationship than them just holding your money. Because if that's all they do, a piggy bank can do that. They should be educating you. They should be helping you do better with whatever your financial goal is. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why a lot of financial institutions, they'll say, hey, come in for a financial checkup, financial wellness. Take advantage of those because if you don't, how are you progressing? Most people are not self-aware enough to progress on their own. Mm -hmm. I know I, I'm in banking, but I have a financial advisor. They are, you need other people's opinions, other people's thoughts, other people's um, observation to help you be better. So it doesn't matter what level of experience, whatever money you have, you, everyone can use somebody to help them progress. Yeah. Um, any thoughts on those seven? <laughs> no, I think those are really good um, thoughts. Um, the, I think the one also thing I would throw in there is if you are working with a therapist, talk about it. You know, talk about like oh, that needs to be number stress. one. Work with um, a therapist. <laughs> just because it's a stressor in itself. So right. talk about it, you know, and process it. Um, and even talk about if budgeting makes you anxious, talk about that. Because a lot of things we talk about finances, it's very anxious. Um, probing and provoking that's the word i was looking for right. um and so it could be a lot but just processing it and just even sometime after having that raw conversation it may not look as bad as you think it looks absolutely awesome awesome so hopefully we were able to give you some good information about uh, mental health when it comes to um, your finances in general um, therapy i think can help a lot of people depending on what your situation is. Um, I know personally, you know, if I didn't have my wife, I'd probably need to, because that's, you know, that's who I lean on. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie, I lean on. Um, but if there ever comes a time where we're struggling together, um, you know, you, you're gonna be the first person we call. And if there's any other stressors that we have, you'll be the first person we call. So I would just implore people to make sure that they're assessing their situation and don't be afraid to reach out um, to a therapist and try to you know, help with their needs. Any last words before we move on to the nonprofit? So, and I would encourage, therapy is not meant for crazy people. <laughs> you don't have to be crazy to see a therapist. And not. I tell my clients, a therapist needs a therapist and I have a therapist myself. Um, it's just a unbiased ear exactly. and that's the thing you have to remember and we're held, held by the code of ethics so we do not put your business out there in the public right and we're actually your business is safe with us so just if you just need someone to talk to and process therapy is good absolutely um, you don't have to be crazy to be have a therapist um so and um, i'm sorry before we move on you had um you had an article. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to make sure we highlighted that because I, <laughs> um, if you want to tell people about the article, because I know I saw it on LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Who, who did the piece on it? So um, we were spotlight on spotlight, um, on University of Small Business Department Center, of, of Pitt, of Pitt, University of Pitt Small Business yes. Department. Development. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Um, and so she wrote an article about success of For My Good. And the article just talked about um, my values, the mission of the um, organization. And the more, big, biggest thing for us is that we meet clients where they're at. Yes. So I don't force you, and neither none of the therapists that work for me force you to be somewhere that you're not ready to be. Right. Um, we meet you if you're still sitting on the floor crying, we're sitting on the floor crying with you, mm -hmm. and we walk with you. and. And that's the biggest thing that um, she focused on. And she just talked about that we, um, I think she said we either are a cultural beacon, which I thought was really cool. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I never looked at myself as that. But the biggest hey, thing I'll is teach I, you <laughs> cultural um, beacon. I love it. I really value on is just being that sounding board for clients. And that's why I said don't look at therapy as you got to be crazy, more right. look at it as the fact that you, um, just need someone to talk to. Absolutely. Um, you know, you're sitting 
either in your house or on a couch. No, you don't have to lay, but you're just sitting there and you're just having a frank conversation, just like we're having here. I think a lot of people's knowledge about therapy comes from to me moving. Yes. Because so. a lot of people wait for me to bring out the book. Right. And then they look at the couch. Oh, this this is the couch. No, it's just the couch. I, honestly, I would encourage people just to try therapy just so they can get away from all the stigma and the you know, stereotypes from what movies portray. Yeah. Um, you 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 would get a, a shock when you really meet meet us. We're not that. That's yeah. not us. Well, <laughs> it does look cool on the TV, I guess, you know. Right. I'll sometime I'll watch it and I'll be like, hmm, I would never say that in session. Right. But you know, they're on T V, you know. <laughs> yeah. If it ain't juicy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that segues perfectly into your nonprofit, which you're the founder of. We are beautiful. Um, because honestly, that's kind of how we first met, mm -hmm. um, this past summer, if I remember correctly, yes. we were at Davis Consulting Solutions in, uh, their UPMC, uh, where they work out of UPMC in, uh, Gar uh East Liberty yeah, Garfield yeah. area. Yeah. Um, and it was the community center and you were a vendor. I was a vendor and we just started connecting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, oh, what is We Are Beautiful? Um, obviously, it, my intentions was just, I like to, one, I like to meet all the black people in the room. I'll just be honest. <laughs> and then two, I was like, I was, I knew I was getting into my podcast and I wanted to do more speaking engagements about financial literacy. Mm -hmm. So when I was like, I was like, what is We Are Beautiful? And then that's how we connected. <laughs> and so let's just start by letting people know what, we are beautiful is and how you came uh, how it came to be and what your inspiration and creativity um so we are beautiful outreach programs um is the organization that is dedicated to building self-esteem and emo emotional intelligence intelligence and young girl well girls and young women between the ages of eight and 18. yes um how do, how do we are beautiful came about um it was it was a brainchild of mine. It started in 2018, and um, it was just I provided a space, a place for um, young girls to come together and just talk about self-esteem issues. I noticed it was a common theme when parents would bring their young girls in, and they'd be like, "They're depressed." And I'm like, "Yeah, it's a little. It's not just depression." Right. And so it really was just that safe space, um, and so. I started in 2018 and then I put it on the back burner for a minute because it just wasn't ready yet. And then I brought it back out in 2020. And so we did two groups, um, two year um, sessions right. from, 20, from 2020 to 2022. And then in 2022, we became a nonprofit. Awesome. Congrats. And I'll be ready. I would feel bad if I didn't mention um, our relationship continued to blossom. And then I was able to introduce my wife to you mm -hmm. um, because just based on conversations I had with her, um, shout out to Gloria Culberson, <laughs> um, based on conversations I had with her, um, she wanted to be on some boards and she wanted to you know, be more active in the community. And, you know, your mission and what I, because I got on the website, you know, I got to meet you more. I got to understand what your mission is. And, you know, I was like, hey, babe, you should talk with Starmisha and see, um, you know, what this is all about. Um, and this might be right up your alley. So, you know, I look forward to the work you guys are going to do because um, while I don't have any children, I observe a lot of what I see <laughs> in my surroundings and in my community. And we need more organizations like the one you've created to help our youth and our young women and have that safe space so mm -hmm. um kudos to you and all your staff i don't want to name drop because i might miss somebody's name but <laughs> there ain't um, many of us <laughs> yeah <laughs> hey but it hey, starts somewhere um so with that being said um i had the pleasure of seeing um one of your first events with few of the young ladies you were working with um, at your, was that your, that's your, that's not where you do your um, practice, right? Where yeah, the at? building. Yeah, the building. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is, okay. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the turnout was phenomenal. 
based on what I saw. You know, I didn't go in, but I was like, <laughs> I was like oh, yeah. Um, so just how have things been? How are things been gra- progressing? And then uh, where do you see things moving forward? Um, so we end up doing, we, we just did a full circle cohort with um, social venture partners through um, the Equity Impact Center. Okay. And we completed that in December. So we did a final case I in December. I saw that with uh, Leah Solomon. Yes. I love Leah. Um, yeah, <laughs> Leah is really great. Um, yeah. And so finishing that out, it really gave me the fun, the like the fundamentals to mm-hmm. build organization. Um, because I'm coming, as you know, from mental health. Right. I'm a therapist, and my mind does not think business. My mind thinks something totally different. Right. And so to even be in a nonprofit world has been eye opening to me because I always thought like. You send someone a little paper and say, I need $5,000. And they say, here's your $5,000 because you're a nonprofit. Yeah, I learned that's not how it works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It does not. Um, just because you're a nonprofit, one, we do not have money. And then two, because we're a nonprofit, does not mean everyone gives us money. Yes. Um, but so after completing that, the three goals that I had during the cohort was to start securing financial um stability for the organization, have an executive board, and then um, develop curriculum. Yeah. So those were my three main goals that I didn't have, but those were fundamentals that I needed. So to present to a school, I need a curriculum to say, this is what I do. Right. And this is like how, this is how we do it. Um, a board, you just need, have to have a board as a nonprofit, but also to even function or a functioning organization you need a board and so that was a big thing because i carried the load by myself um and so to have a board to sit around and be like this is what's going on let's talk about this is really exciting for me yes um and then to be able to secure financial um stability is to be able to continue to have groups moving forward so um the process the cohort was a it was a great experience for me i I, um, we have um, gained mentors and I've gained partners. I've gained friends. I've done co- started getting collabs. So it really put us on a different platform. Um, we're still trying to get more awareness and get people to understand who we are, what we do, and the mission. Um, because a lot of people who do know me just I do mental health. So a few people are like, I didn't even know you had a nonprofit. Like right. this is really different. So to even be able to have that, um, to get more awareness is really great um, to be able to be able to provide this service. So moving forward, we um, have three programs that we will be um, launching. Um, well, actually, they're already launched. So we've been in the schools. We've been in two schools. Propel, correct. Propel and Homestead. And then we're also in Manchester on the north side. So we're completing them up next week. And then um, i just been kind of hitting the pavement, sending out emails to anyone just to kind of see if we can collab or any way I can come in and provide the service to, yeah. to, um, to them. And then I do a community group where the girls come to me, instead of me going to the schools, they come to me to the office and we meet monthly and we do that monthly. Yeah. Um, and so that's another piece. And then the last piece, which I'm super excited about, we'll be launching in the fall is a mentorship. So it's called You Are Beautiful Mentoring Program. So yes. we will have this, it's from girls from the ages of 14 to 18, and they will be, um, I don't wanna use the word train, cause that's not what I do. Right. They will be, um, we will teach them and they will learn how to give back to the younger ones. And so the younger ones, when we get them all together, they look look up to the older ones and it's right. so cute. Like, oh my goodness, you're so pretty. What do you do? Let me see your phone. <laughs> And so it's just good for them to be able to give back to them and to have those conversations and even tell them, like, when I was your age, I struggled with that um, because they probably will relate more with them. So that's the newest program we have. And I'm not sure what we're going to do for the summer. I'm still playing with it. But the two main things will be the mentoring and the self-esteem group. So um, definitely check us out because we do have some things coming down the horizon. Yes. Honestly, and I love um, the maturation I've seen in a short amount of time um, from when I met you over the summer to where you are now. So kudos to you, um, because I've seen progress and progression 
Um, and I know that you're going to, you know, thrive and you continue to make connections. Hell, you know me. So, <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to continue to um, push you and encourage you to, you know, do this, do that while we, um, and now that we've built a relationship and I have a better understanding, hell, my wife works with you, you know, we, we work it with you. Um, you know, I want to see you still have all the resources and connections that you need to be successful in the space. Um, because, I mean, this is the work you're doing and what you've started and created is so pivotal. Um, that's sort of a similar feeling that I have with um, our young men. Mm -hmm. And I know that we've talked about this, my, my brother is pretty yeah. much like the opposite of, yeah. <laughs> opposite of your organization. Um, check out the Moxie organization. Um, that was an episode I had him on the podcast. Uh, so shout out to Tori. Um, but, you know, anytime we have you guys doing the work that is so pivotal to our youth, um, I'm just always ecstatic and I want to be a part to help in any way I can. So anytime you need the financial literacy part, you already know who to call. I so. I was, as I was sitting here thinking, I'm like, I'm going to have them come talk to the girls. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You just. <laughs> <laughs> so um, with that being said, um, is there anything else about We Are Beautiful that uh, the audience should know? Um, one, the website. Um, and I know you've been extremely active on Facebook. So if you are not, if you are on Facebook, uh, please make sure you like um, and subscribe and check out um, not only this podcast, Financial Literacy with TC, on YouTube, Spotify, but uh, we are beautiful. Um, even donate, you know, if you have the means to do so, because if you have a young girl, if you have a young daughter, niece, um, this is a great resource that you could probably tap into. Um, and hell, if you want to be a part of an organization that's up and coming and doing great things in the community, uh, reach out and, you know, I'm sure you can help and collab with you and get some yeah. amazing things done. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if you just want to leave all the information that people need to be able to get in touch with you. So on Facebook is We Are Beautiful Outreach Programs, Inc. Um, so that's where you find us on Facebook. And then on Instagram, it is um, We Are Beautiful Outreach Programs. I think it's still, yeah, Outreach Programs, Inc. as well. Um, if you type it in, we should pop up. We have, um, it's like a pinkish color right. um, <laughs> logo. So if you see the pinkish color logo, that is us. Um, Instagram, I do um, Instagram on Instagram. LinkedIn, I do post us on LinkedIn, but not as much. And then we do have a TikTok, but it's not as active. I'm still learning to figure out TikTok, <laughs> but mostly when we're active on Instagram and um, Facebook. So check us out. Um, and then we have a website, which is um, waboutreach.org. And on there, you can donate, you can get involved, or you can register um, your child for um, upcoming um, upcoming groups. So you just go in there, fill out the interest form, we'll get it. And then once we start sending out information, you will be the first to get the emails to let you know that a group is starting. Yes. And if you want to throw out the address of the area, um, Verona, correct? Yes. Um, so that way people know, because a lot of times, you know, if they're all the way in the South Hills, West End, North Side, um, at least like them have a general idea, um, you know, how they can connect. I mean, hell, if a valuable resource for your youth, you know, you got to be committed to helping them and travel where the resources are. Now, all the... There's a lot of times the resources that we need aren't in the community that we live in. So, you know, if you're really serious about, you know, impacting the youth, you got to come to where the resources are. So, um, I know you know the specific address off the top of your head. <laughs> so, we are located on, in Verona, um, 6031 Salzburg Road. Um, so, that's where we are at. But if you're not in the area, I would say, you know, you can bring us to you. Yes. Um, we can always do um, a group with, you know, within the area. So we are open to those different opportunities and we're just, the biggest thing is getting awareness. So getting people to know we're out there. This exactly. is, a, we're providing a service for young girls. Um, and it's very much needed. It's very much needed for our young girls. I've seen oh, yeah. young girls go from being 
like straight up bullies to being the sweetest things ever. I've seen young girls go from being don't even speak two words right. to talk my ear off and make friends. And so this program from if I was a young girl, I would want this program. Absolutely. Um, not because it's my program, but just because that's the space young girls need. And we they definitely need that. Our young girls are suffering and they really need to understand that they are beautiful and understand the importance of beauty and not what they're seeing on social media. Absolutely. And honestly, I know um, while I don't have children, I have nieces and a lot of times there's a space where they don't feel comfortable talking to mommy and daddy. Mm -hmm. So they need to have another outlet and why not it be an organization um, that is focused on the mental um, and just health in general. So why not give them that resource? If you try to force a situation where they may not feel comfortable with you, you know, you could do more harm than good. So um, at least that's what I've witnessed. Um, it's, you know, sometimes it hits different when it comes from a, yeah. you know, another person. So uh, with all that being said, um, so I want to thank you for joining me. Um, You're welcome. Is there any last words or thoughts you want to give to people either about the organization or um, our topic about mental health when it comes to finance? I would just encourage if you've been thinking about getting a therapist or wanting to see what therapy is about, I would encourage you to try it. Um, just try it one time. You may, you probably would like it. Right. Um, <laughs> I would say you may like You probably would like it. Um, so definitely there's... Um, there's a handful of us out there who are providing services that are black, and there's so, there is a few black-owned um, therapy um, counseling services. So check us out. We are out there to provide services not only to you but also to your children, family, whatever may need. And then for the nonprofit itself, I would just say check us out. You know, if you are on social media, please go in and like our page. Yes. Um, and go in and follow us, share, um, because if you don't have a niece, I mean, you have a daughter or a niece or even a girl, you, there's a girl in your life that can utilize a service. And the question that I asked at my pitch was, raise your hand if you said that you had enough self-esteem during your childhood. And really think about that. If, you, if you're like sitting that. in a room, raise your hand. <laughs> if you had that. And none of us really can raise our hand yeah. because we all suffer some way, shape or form during mm -hmm. our childhood. And so if you can relate on that level, then I would say, if you don't know any children, you can always donate, sponsor um, young girls to be able to participate in the program. I like so, that. Um, you can find me on any <laughs> social media thing, Starshima Duncan, um, and it, to reach out to me to ask any questions. Absolutely. Alrighty, so I want to thank you guys as always for joining me. Um, you can find me, Financial Literacy with TC, Facebook, Spotify, YouTube. Please like, share, subscribe. Um, the goal is to bring more financial topics, more special guests who have a level of expertise that can help our communities. Um, but it all starts with your support. So as always, I want to thank you for joining me, and we'll see you next week for the next episode. You guys take care.